Okay, I also try with this microphone. So welcome everyone. I'm very happy to be able to present uh, the book Macroeconomics in Context, European Perspective here, because this book in a way is an FMM baby. Uh, a few years back, I think it was in 2014, we had Jonathan Harris here and he presented the US version of that book. Afterwards, and in this way, today is a slight replay, Marc Lavoie commented on that book, and at night we were sitting together with a number of people and discussing the book further, and my colleague, who's now retired and also is at the conference, Jan Prive, he sat together with Jonathan Harris, and they discussed that they, there would be a need for a European version of that book. And um, I had discussed with Jan Prive about that before, because I've been using the U.S. version in my classes, but I wasn't happy with the references to U.S. institutions, and I wasn't happy especially with some of the ways the U.S. version was treating money. And uh, so we, we started talking, and out of that grew this project to Europeanize this version, or this book. And um, so, well, we, we had a number of email exchanges, and in the end we agreed that I would um, take this book and uh, well, would write some, some new chapters about European problems, would uh, fit European institutions in, questions of European integration, uh, change the things on the money supply and on the macroeconomic model we didn't like very much, and um, well, this is the result from it. Um, so let me start looking at the book and talk a little bit about the idea, the history and the content. Well, the idea about this textbook was that we said, well, we want a textbook which addresses explicitly different paradigms, um, which contrasts, I mean, we are aware that you cannot have a dozen of paradigms in an introductory textbook, but we want at least to make, to, to show the students that there are different paradigms in economics and that it matters that there are different paradigms. So we concentrate mostly on the classical and the Keynesian paradigm, and then in certain um, paragraphs we add the differences between traditional Keynesianism, New Keynesianism, a bit of post-Keynesianism. The second thing we wanted to do is um, to present macroeconomics under the consideration of social, gender, and environmental aspects. Because many of the traditional textbooks don't do that. They neglect, for example, completely the environmental problems of growth, and we are discussing that as well. And that also leads to the whole combination of social, gender, and environmental aspects, leads to a thorough discussion of inequality throughout our book. And finally, we wanted to apply the macroeconomics to real-world institutions of the European Union and to real-world problems students can relate to. Very often we see these textbooks, which then also have the examples from the national accounts from the United States, and if the students for the first time, maybe if they do an internship, have to find data on European economies, they find out that the methodology or this is slightly different and they cannot really relate to the concepts. And when I worked at Financial Times Deutschland, we had a lot of um, interns from very good German universities and they had no idea whatsoever what, about the magnitude of German GDP. They couldn't say whether it was 200 billion or 2,000 billion. And again, um, our book tries to, to teach the students macroeconomics in a way that at least they have an idea about these magnitudes. So the history of the book is um, that the European version builds on the US, the US version, which came into being around 2003 and was first available as PDFs for free download on the internet. They were done, then there was the first printed edition in 2003 um, and the second edition in 2007, and now my colleagues are working at the third edition. This has now all moved towards Routledge, where our book is also published. Um, it is a commercial publishing house, but we have negotiated very strongly with them that the book is competitively priced, and I'll come to that later, so that the students, that we do not increase inequality among the students just by, by the book price. Um, let me just go through the content. Um, well, the book has four parts. The first part is the context for economic analysis. There we present some basic indicators of economic well-being beyond also uh, just the standard macroeconomic indicators. We talk about um, life expectancy, about carbon dioxide emission, about pollution, and so on. Um, we present some useful tools and concepts, discuss what a model is, what different paradigms are, we um, present the simple supply and demand diagrams. So if you 
teach this to use this for teaching students who haven't had a microeconomics course before. You have a chapter in here for that. You don't have to use it if they have a good uh, good foundation in that. And then we have the second part, which are macroeconomic basics. We start with standard national accounts. According, we discuss a bit the history of that, and then we come to the European Union methodology. We um, here have also a section on measuring of inflation. Um, we have then a whole chapter which criticizes and discusses the shortcomings of GDP and presents alternative ways of, of uh, measuring well-being. So here we discuss whether you should have a scoreboard approach or whether you should have a, um, a one, one single indi indicator or index in which you add some environmental issues. Uh, we also present here the Europe 2020 strategy and the scoreboard approach used there. Um, then we have a chapter which you usually don't find in textbooks, and that's, I'm not sure whether, how many are, using, are going to use that, but this is again to relate to the real world the students know, and this gives you an insight into the European economy and the structure. I mean, what, what do we have, how, how big is manufacturing, how big is the service sector, what counts as a service sector, what about um, cross-country supply chains, and when, what we discuss here is um, in how far is the Porsche still a German car because we have so many parts imported from other parts and uh, we contrast the differences in the structure, for example, between the UK and the German economy. Um, then we discuss employment, unemployment and wages. Uh, this is basically first on the statistics but also we present some labor market models here. And yes, we have a simple supply and demand diagram when we refer to the classical model and we explain how the classical economists believe that minimum wages lead to unemployment because, frankly, this is still the reference many of my German colleagues use when they are talking about minimum wages and the effects of that. Uh, we might not believe in that, but I think the students should know that and we contrast that to other different views and uh, to empirical experience. Um, in the chapter, in the part on macroeconomic theory and policy, we start with aggregate demand and economic fluctuations, um, discussing the Keynesian approach, the Keynesian cross, and um, how we can have uh, involuntary investment here. We have a chapter on fiscal policy, then on money, banking, and finance. I'll come to that in a moment where we focus on the banks as the agents or the institutions creating money in an economy. And we add the central bank in the next step. And central bank in our book sets the interest rate and influences by that decision what the commercial banks are doing. And the reserve creation is just a reflex of what the commercial banks have been doing. Um, well, then we put it all together into an ASAD model. I'll explain a little bit later what that means because it's not the traditional ASAD model we use, but a variant with which I think many can live um, who don't like the traditional ASAD model. We have a chapter on global linkages. In this chapter we also cover, I mean, not just uh, a bit, just, just a brief idea of macroeconomics for an open economy, but here we also discuss, for example, what Brexit will might mean and why people uh, might have voted for Brexit and against globalization. Um, then finally, we have a fourth part where there are selected macroeconomic issues and applications, and the idea is that you can choose a uh, selection of these chapters. You don't have to do all of them, but depending on your students and your interests, you can look into specific topics which are high on the agenda of economic policy discussions lately. And we have first a chapter on the financial crisis and the Great Recession. Um, I noticed that for many of my students, this is now already history, um, even though many of you remind, re, uh, remember that very vividly, but still I think it is important to learn about it to understand the instabilities of um, capitalist systems. Then we have a chapter on deficits and debts. This talks about debt dynamics. It also covers what deflation means for debt dynamics that it's not just, um, well, the government overspending, which might lead to over indebtedness of the government. Here we also discuss the European rules for, bud for budget deficits and debt. Um, and this is followed for by a chapter on the Euro crisis, in which we try to give a simple but yet comprehensive narrative of what has happened in Europe um, in the past years. And we apply our ASD model on this. <coughs> 
Um, finally, we have two chapters on long-run growth, how economies grow and develop, um, and including um, the sustainable development goals. So we discuss what the broader vision of development is. And we finish with a chapter on sustainability in the 21st century, which looks at um, carbon dioxide emission, other environmental problems, and demographics. So um, I would now like to show you how we contrast paradigms. And this is just one example. Um, as I said, for us, it's important for the students to decide uh, to, to learn that the disputes among economists stem from very different understandings of how the economy works. And so we try to, in a simplified way, to, to present different paradigms. And here we contrast the classical and the Keynesian paradigm in the circular flow of income. Um, the classical paradigm here would be that you have outcome, uh, so the output which the production generates the income. Part of the income is consumed, so this is aggregate demand. And, uh, but you have savings. Um, they are a leakage here. But in the classical model, that's not a problem because you have the, the market for loanable funds. And if that market is in equilibrium, all the savings will be recycled into investment and you have a, well, a smooth circular flow without any endogenous uh, changes. Um, the Keynesian paradigm as we see it and as we present it is different here. You still start from output which produces income, but then you have the leakage savings and there is no direct way why the savings should be equal to intended investment because there are two different actors which make the decision. The households decide how much to consume and to save and the firms decide how much to invest. And we discussed that why savings might not be interest elastic and why intended investment might also not be interest elastic and then the spending might or might not be sufficient to buy the output and the circular flow is disrupted. So in this way uh, we try to show the, the, the students that there are different ways of thinking of uh, this economy. So um, in our macroeconomic approach I already said we start from the simple Keynesian multiplier model but uh, in contrast to more traditional textbooks, we don't have the LM curve, but we then come to an ASAD model by saying, well, the central bank sets the short-term interest rate as a reaction to inflation, and um, because of that, we get a downward sloping aggregate demand cut in an in inflation output space. That is a bit more in the tradition of the Roma adjustment of the ASAD model than of the traditional textbook models, but I think it is something where the students can relate to more easily. Um, I also believe that this narrative we have here can appeal both to new Keynesians and post-Keynesians. It's not something which, which would be limited to one of the groups. Uh, so I think it's a, a good way of explaining that. But and this is what I also would like to underline different from the core textbook. We do not have an explicit micro foundation. We have micro plausibilization in this book but we do not say that all this comes from some explicit maximization um, of household utility or household uh, um, actions. Okay, um, so this is how it looks like. We have the inflation rate here. We have the output here. We have an AS curve, which has a horizontal um, area, which we explain. In that time, basically, unions do not bargain for higher wages. Um, there are no capacity constraints. So if you shift the AD curve in this area, um, you just shift the output away or closer to full employment output, but there is no change in inflation. Um, once you get into territory where uh, unemployment is very high, this will change because then some structures of wage bargaining might break down or change. And if you get into uh, an area where there are real capacity constraints and firms can really hike, wage, uh, hike prices, then you get into the area of, of increasing inflation. So that's the basic basic ASAD model. We have a number of ways how we uh, rationalize that and how we apply that, but this is the basics. Okay, um, let me come to the book's coverage of money. As I said, money is introduced as credit money created by commercial banks, which I think is, uh, well, uh, the best way of describing what we are having today in the developed economies. And the central bank is just added as the source of reserves. We stress or we, we rationalize that mainly by uh, referring to institutional details which make clear that money creation by the commercial banks comes before acquiring reserves. In the euro area, you have roughly, well, the commercial banks 
have their reserve requirements are computed at the end of the month, and then they have almost another month to get the reserves. So this shows that from a causality, it doesn't make sense to think about running from reserves to um, the money supply. Okay, um, and as I said, I think this results in an endogenous money approach, which is acceptable to both post-Keynesians and new Keynesians. And just to underline this, uh, this is basically uh, built on the work by Ulrich Binzeil. He's working for the ECB and worked for a long time in the securities department there. Um, so he is not, I wouldn't say, not a traditional heterodox economist. Let me now come to the current real world topics which we have um, covered in this book. And you see that there is a strong focus on the European Union, the euro area here, because the book was written with this in mind. So this is different from the core econ textbook, which I think has a broader, um, broader set of examples also from emerging markets and developing countries. We have a strong focus on the euro crisis, as mentioned again and again when we talk about unemployment, why it has increased in some countries. I think you cannot explain that without the euro crisis. We talk about Brexit, um, we talk about inequality, we have a box on credit rationing in the crisis, we talk about instruments of non-traditional monetary policy, so we discuss quantitative easing and negative interest rates by the central bank, we contrast recovery experiences in Ireland and Greece and use our ASAD model to explain why in one of the countries maybe um, the austerity plus structural reforms had different effects than in another country. We talk about the GDP mismeasuring in Ireland when GDP from one quarter to another increased by 25% because you had some uh, movement of corporate headquarters to Ireland. Um, we include the Europe 2020 strategy. We talk finally about the Paris Agreement on climate change. And these are just some examples for um, the real world topics we cover. So um, when he talked about making transition costs for lecturers lower, um, we also try to do that. We have complete lecture slides for this book by now, something which the US edition doesn't have yet. We have lecture notes, including solutions to the end of um, chapter problems. Uh, the problems often include tasks where students have to look for real statistics on real world statistical office websites and present them. We have a test bank um, and uh, actually this, this was also mentioned before. No, that wasn't mentioned before. Um, we have tables for the national accounts and the balance of payments for all EU countries. So if you are teaching in one of the EU countries, you can pull a table which looks like the one in the book for your individual country and compare that to the other countries. Um, so let me close with an advertisement. Um, this book is, well, we fought hard with Routledge to make it competitively priced. It's now 39 pounds 99. I think you can buy it at Amazon for 42. If you handful copies, you can buy at the conference desk for 33 euros here. If you want to order it, um, there's a 20% discount code here. But I think uh, 40 pounds is still okay, given that some of the publishers are now charging outrageous prices for uh, at least the US edition of, the text, of other textbooks. Okay, thank you very much. That I did uh, discuss the second edition, second US edition a few years ago of this Macroeconomics in Context. In fact, it was uh, the second time because I wrote a, a small book review in Egypt uh, of the first US edition. Uh, so, this is the, the third time now that I am uh, involved with Economics in Context. By the way, I should say that I also reviewed the intermediate or advanced macroeconomics book by Wendy Carlin and Soskise, and uh, they, it's one of the most successful uh, article in EG because it has many downloads. I sent it to her, but she never told me what she thought about the book review. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I myself have, has, have written uh, a book, uh, a first year micro and macro textbook that was based on Baumol and Blinder, so it was the same exercise as you did, which is you start with a US edition and then you make it into a Canadian context. Um, so that was about eight years ago, so I do realize that uh, both for Wendy Carlin and Sebastian that it, it's a lot of work 
And I think we should all be grateful to these uh, authors who, who do take the time to write these uh, textbooks. Okay, I'm going to proceed in three steps. I'm going to start with uh, <clears throat> saying what I found to be uh, really good uh, in the book to make sure that I'm not being cut off by the chair of this uh, session. And then I'll uh, discuss um, in, I'll discuss the book in relation to the U.S. edition. So in, uh, in what I did uh, three or four years ago, I had identified a few points in the U.S. edition where I was dissatisfied. And so uh, I'll discuss whether the new uh, version, the European version, cor has corrected these uh, problems from my point of view. And then I'll mention a few uh, additional issues that I have noted in the European uh, edition. Okay. Um, well, first, uh, it's true that, uh, as Sebastian has explained, there's usually a presentation of the so-called classical view and the Keynesian view. Uh, and I think he, uh, it's, he's quite right to uh, oversimplify in this manner, otherwise the students get lost. And in, when I used to teach first-year economics, I used to talk of the bad guys, the new classicals, and the good guys <laughs> that were the Keynesians. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of institutional detail in, uh, in the book. For instance, uh, all the various financial intermediaries uh, are being presented. In fact, I, I learned a little bit just by uh, going over the, the table that explained what each financial intermediary uh, was doing. Uh, there's uh, also there's a lot about the recent economic uh, history. Uh, of course, there's a discussion of the subprime financial crisis, uh, but there's also quite a lot on the evolution of the European fiscal rules. Um, well, after the subprime crisis, we had the euro crisis, uh, which came about in part as a result of the European monetary uh, integration. So uh, I, I thought that uh, this was really well presented in the sense that the, we had both views, so to speak, the, and uh, the issues were presented in a way where you could see that, well, there are different opinions. You could see they were there were, uh, this, these issues were very much disputed. <clears throat> the, the pros and the cons of the various rules uh, were also clearly uh, presented. Uh, maybe the only drawback I, I could mention is that although there's a long discussion of what the European Central Bank has been doing since August 2012 and the famous uh, Mario Draghi saying, I will do everything that is needed, there is as far as I could see, uh, no discussion of what the European Central Bank did between, say, January 2010 and August 2012, which I think is the crucial moment uh, in the history of the Euro crisis. What did the Central Bank do to avoid uh, the Euro crisis? Um, when, uh, so after having read all these uh, discussions about the rules, the Eurozone, uh, the, the various fiscal rules, um, one comes out with a really pessimistic view of what uh, can happen uh, with respect to the European economy, in the sense that it, it seems that there's a lot of things that could be done to improve the situation, but politically they all seem to be impossible uh, to put in place. So in a sense, uh, it represented the, the dismal science. This was the feeling uh, I got. And also, um, and, and this fit with my impression of the situation in Europe, um, I, when looking at the euro crisis, I think the book explains very well the, the weakness and or the weaknesses of the current institutions in the eurozone. Okay, so uh, this uh, this is the, uh, the the first part. Now, the coming to the second part. 
um, in, in, in the discussion that I had in 2014, and which was then published in Egypt, uh, I mentioned a, a number of things that had annoyed me <coughs> in the U.S. edition. And, uh, and so let's look at these uh, points uh, in order. The, the first uh, point was that the slope of the aggregate demand, which is downward sloping, uh, was based, as, as was mentioned by Sebastian, uh, by the wealth effect. Uh, so this has been corrected in the European uh, edition in the sense that it's explained by the reaction function of the central bank. And in, in, when we are in a large economy, and the other point which is made is that if we are talking about a smaller economy, then it's explained by uh, the, the competitive effect on external markets. The, the fact that the rate, if the rate of inflation is higher, uh, then it will make the economy less competitive relative to its others. Um, there was, uh, I, I, okay, in the US edition, there was, in my, I mean, there was a discussion about deflation, but there was no real explanation of why deflation is a bad thing. Uh, whereas in the European edition, there's a long explanation about why central bankers uh, fear deflation and why deflation, in contrast to what one might be tempted to believe based on the, the standard arguments, is uh, something that, that can be dangerous. Uh, another good point, uh, no, another great change uh, in the book uh, has also been mentioned by Sebastian is that uh, the new version, the European version, rejects the traditional view of deposits, making loans, or, re or reserves of the central bank allowing uh, firms to make uh, credit and, and, and to make loans. Uh, sorry, to make deposits and to make loans. Uh, and it's, so it is clearly stated that reserves are not a constraint to banks lending. And there is an explicit, uh, there, there are several passages where the authors explain that uh, there is in fact reverse causality between re uh, reserves and deposits or credits. Um, on points where I was maybe not fully satisfied with the new version, uh, in the US version there was a lot of space given to crowding out um, so government expenditures crowding out uh, private expenditures. There's still uh, a fair amount of space devoted to crowding out. Uh, there is, however, a fairly long discussion of the possibility of crowding in. Uh, but I think it would have been interesting to introduce Kaleski's profit equation to show that, well, if you have an increase everything else being constant. If you have an increase in government deficit, this will lead to larger profits of the corporate sector. Um, another point is about the, uh, the quantity theory of money and uh, the idea that an increase in money, the money stock leads to an increase in prices or in, uh, in the rate of inflation. Uh, this is discussed at two different uh, spots in, in the book. Um, and uh, I had the feeling that, uh, yeah, this um, link between the money supply and uh, prices was overly emphasized. Uh, so for instance, there's the discussion of hyperinflation in Germany. And so the, the culprit uh, seems to be the, the stock of money, but there's no reference to the fact that, well, what about then the depreciation of the exchange rate play uh, any role. And in the discussion of the, the quantity theory of money, there's a fair bit of discussion about the fact that the velocity of money can be unstable, uh, but there is no explicit uh, statement that in fact we can have reverse causality in the sense that it's the increase in prices and quantities that drive the increase in, in the money supply, even though the, the velocity could be constant. So, uh, so I would conclude this part by saying that overall, uh, yeah, they have successfully remedied to the, um, 
weaknesses of the U.S. edition, and in particular on, uh, on the issue of money creation, the relation between the commercial banks and the central bank. Um, so I'll do a little bit of nitpicking here. Um, uh, so just a, a, a few, uh, maybe four further remarks uh, of things that uh, struck me. So those are new issues. Maybe, I'd, maybe they were already in the U.S. edition, but I didn't notice them. Uh, and I, I only noticed them reading the European edition. Um, there's a, there's a, a presentation of the loanable funds model. And it is argued that, well, if we have uh, flexible interest rates, these interest rates will equalize the supply and demand of loanable funds. But, I mean, as a reader, I, I put myself in the situation of a first-year student. Why is it that the equalization of the supply and demand of loanable funds is necessarily going to be at full employment? You know, it's, uh, the, there's nothing before or after this statement that explains it. For instance, there's a, so here I'm going to read exactly what is written. Uh, with saving, it's on page 300. With saving and investment always in balance, there is no reason to think that the economy would diverge from full employment. So maybe in the you know, most sophisticated neoclassical models, uh, this would be true, but in the book, as presented, we, I mean, as a naive reader, uh, I, I could not see why it should be at full employment necessarily. Uh, another nitpicking, but this is a, a question that is debatable within uh, post-Keynesian economics or new Keynesian economics. It's uh, what, it's the role of the equity of banks. So there, on a few occasions, there is the statement that banks uh, were lacking the capital base they needed to make loans. A little bit uh, later, it is said, because banks had to write down their, their capital because of, uh, well, I can't read my own writing, <laughs> because of loss, okay, because banks had to write down their capital uh, because of losses on their loan portfolios, they were unable to lend as much. Um, so there are people who believe that banks are unable to lend because they don't have enough uh, equity, they don't respect the capital adequacy ratios. I happen to believe that this must be really in exceptional circumstances. So uh, I, I would object to this kind of uh, statement. And in fact, uh, Sebastian and I were in a session this uh, morning where there was a presentation by some Brazilian economist who uh, made the claim, although she couldn't tell us why from her empirical results this was true, who made the claim that, uh, that cap the capital adequacy ratio didn't play any role in, uh, in stopping bank loans in Brazilian banks. Um, a couple of, uh, of other things, um, yeah, it, it is written on page 346 that John Maynard Keynes acknowledged the potential for, for crowding out. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, except in a recession, I mean, so the, the idea is that if we are not in a recession, Keynes believes that the, there, there is potential for crowding out. My understanding of Keynes, at least uh, in the general theory, is that the only kind of crowding out that he had, is that a five? Yeah. The only kind of crowding out that he had in, in, in mind was a psychological crowding out, meaning that you know, if all these entrepreneurs believe that if the government has to, is running a deficit and has to borrow funds, that this will uh, lead to uh, an increase in interest rates, then so be it. You know, it, it will provoke this psychological crowding out. Um, another nitty uh, picky thing is uh, on page 452 is said that uh, 
post Keynesians believe in hysteresis and path dependence, so Mark Satterfield here will be very happy about this. Uh, so, yes, I agree, except that the example which is being provided uh, for this is that, well, there is a path dependence, hysteresis in unemployment because workers get demoral demoralized, they lose their skills, uh, and so on. So, I don't, I mean, to me, this is not really the, the, the main post Keynesian story. This sounds very much like the new Keynesian story that Wendy Carlin would probably uh, approve. <laughs> Put your uh, words into my mouth again. <laughs> um, okay, just maybe one last thing. Uh, in, in the chapter where there is a dis uh, justification, where, why does money exist, there is the, the chartless story is not told at all. You, know, you could have had a few lines saying that, uh, well, there's a, a number of economists who believe that uh, the reason uh, that, that you know, money becomes used by many people is that this is the, the, the tool that has to be used for people to pay their taxes and therefore this is how uh, somehow the government can impose uh, money to uh, the rest of the economy. Okay, th so this was it. So I mean, overall, those are minor qualms, and uh, I, I think uh, you should all be grateful. I mean, the Europeans should be very grateful to uh, to Sebastian to have taken the time to to rewrite uh, an, uh, this European edition for all these European universities. <laughs>